But battling the main villain is no easy task. If it were, the story wouldn't be about a hero. A hero must be able to do things that most people can't. And so, in this final battle, the hero is typically pushed to the extreme. In fact, the hero at some point in this epic battle almost always seems to lose. And this is step two. It seems that our hero is on the brink of death, literally or metaphorically, only to be resurrected and then triumph over the enemy. We see this when the wizard ostracizes Dorothy and her friends, only to have Toto reveal the wizard's weakness allowing Dorothy to take him down to size with her newfound courage, intelligence, and passion. Luke, too, seems to be on a suicide mission, with R2-D2 zapped and only one long-shot method to destroy the Death Star. We realize that there is no way that this kid from the farm can outperform the Jedi Knights who have died before him. That is, until he is guided by a message from Obi-Wan. Luke combines passion, wisdom, and logic to use the Force to destroy the Death Star. And as Step 2 comes to a close, our hero implements all the lessons he has learned from his allies, the brains and the brawn, the instinct and the reason, the courage and the cunning, and in the end, our hero is able to overcome what many others have not. Victory, which leads to Step 3, our hero receiving a hero's reward. In these movies, quite literally, both Dorothy and Luke take part in a reward ceremony where they are recognized for the valor and the commitment to their friends. This is a common theme in the hero's journey. And you see it in Caddyshack, where Danny wins the tournament. But the reward can also be metaphorical. Now, I won't spoil the end of Shawshank Redemption, but if you've seen it, then you know. Andy Dufresne and Red get their own reward in the end as well. Interesting side note. Frank Darabont, the writer and director of The Shawshank Redemption, he adapted the story from a novella written by horror writer extraordinaire Stephen King. Now, typically, obtaining the rights to a story from a famous author would cost thousands or possibly tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. But back in those days, Stephen King often gave non-exclusive rights to young filmmakers for only a dollar. Frank Darabont made a short film from another Stephen King story in 1983, and so King gave him permission to adapt Shawshank Redemption for just a buck. Eleven years later, the film hit the silver screen to tremendous critical acclaim, and today it's widely considered to be a modern classic. <laughs> but I digress. The hero's journey cannot be complete without the final stage in the journey. According to Joseph Campbell, the classic hero's journey ends with the hero returning home, either literally or metaphorically. And when they return home, they carry with them new knowledge that they learn from their adventure. In Dorothy's case, she literally returns home to Kansas with the knowledge that there truly is no place like home. Luke's home is more metaphorical. Since his family was destroyed by Darth Vader, he has no real home to which to return. But instead, he has a new home, a new family, a Jedi family, and his sister, Princess Leia. And he has learned from their power and the majesty of the Force. And as Obi-Wan Kenobi told him back on the farm, Luke's rightful place is naturally with the Jedi Knights. Danny Noonan also returns victoriously to the Caddyshack. And Andy Dufresne? Well, let's just say that you'll have to go see the movie for this one. So, all told, there are basically 15 steps in the hero's journey, and The Wizard of Oz and Star Wars line up with nearly every single one. But as you could also see, it's not just these two movies. The same could be said for hundreds of the great movie classics, including famous films like Back to the Future, Blade Runner, Casablanca, Deer Hunter, Jaws, Rear Window, Rocky, Silence of the Lambs, Sound of Music, Unforgiven, and almost any animated Disney movie you can think of, just to name a few. But there are also films that break the mold. If you're anything like me, then you're sitting there racking your brain trying to think of great movies that don't fit this paradigm. Maybe you came up with one that I've already discussed, The Godfather. It's not a hero's journey, it's an anti-hero's journey. 
How about Thelma and Louise, where no one returns home in the end? Little Miss Sunshine, an ensemble movie with no single hero? Or how about Badlands, where the characters don't change at all? Yes, these are good examples of great films that diverge from the hero's journey. But in a way, this actually strengthens the point. See, the mold is still there, even if these films break from it at key points. I know it's cliche, but you have to know the rules in order to break them. And in breaking the rules, these films actually use the hero's journey to tell their stories. The Godfather is so powerful because it celebrates a gangster as most celebrate heroes. Thelma and Louise surprises us because we expect them to return home. Little Miss Sunshine treats the family as a whole, as a single heroic unit. And Badlands is so startling because we expect the change, but we don't get the change. So regardless of whether a movie follows the hero's journey, it is affected by the hero's journey. The monomyth is a part of us. But don't take my word for it. Don't take Joseph Campbell's word for it. Try it for yourself. Choose, choose some movies that are on your own greatest movie list and then go enjoy them from a new perspective. See if they follow the monomyth, and if so, how closely. And if not, where, and most importantly, why, do they diverge from it? In closing, I'd like to quote the late, great Roger Ebert. He said we can't help identifying with the protagonist. It's coded in our movie-going DNA. And in that way, I guess, heroes, are the lifeblood that runs through us all.